Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, um, my name is John Adler, and I'm the CEO of Zap. Um, um, some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, I was involved in developing the CyberKnife, and uh, well, very proud of what that meant. Uh, I also came to appreciate the fact that far too many patients in the world do not have access to radio surgery today. And with that understanding, we've actually tried to analyze what that means. And literally, there's two to three million patients a year where we feel in addressable markets, middle income and wealthy countries lack access to radio surgery today. And uh, we're literally treating with current radio surgical technologies less than 10% of the world need. So with that in mind, we try to develop a technology that we thought would address the limitations of existing equipment. And out of that came the ZAP-X, which we're going to be talking about today, the first of its kind, self-shielded radio surgical device. Um, the, uh, I have a very important mission. I'm going to shut up in just a couple of seconds here. Uh, but my primary agenda is to get those of you who like what you see in, the, in this next hour's discussion, by all means, I'd like you to sign up and see the first active, uh, clinically active uh, Zap X machine in the world at the Barron Neurologic Institute. Uh, I'd like you to all stop by the booth and uh, register. There'll be a, uh, a bus leaving very promptly at five o'clock sharp. Uh, Mark Arnold, who's organizing, tells me that if you show up at 5.01, you'll see the bus, the back of the bus is, is pulling out of the parking lot. So please show up beforehand. Uh, the uh, demo at the Barron Neurologic will be between 5.30 and 6.30. There'll be beverages and hors d'oeuvres, so if you're hungry, we will feed you. Um, and then very promptly at 6.30, the buses will leave and bring you back here to the JW Marriott. So seating may be limited, so I urge you to stop by the ZAP exhibit and by all means sign up. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce the two speakers, uh, both from the Barron Neurologic Institute. Uh, they will be talking about the initial clinical experience that has emerged uh, over the course of uh, this year. Uh, first uh, speaker will be, uh, actually, in what order are we going to speak? The first speaker is going to be Igor Barani. Uh, Igor is an old friend since he was at UCSF. Um, he is now leading the radiation oncology department at the Barron Neurologic Institute, and he specializes in a lot of sort of complex computer-driven um, radiation oncology, really medicine of the future, but also has a lot of interest in radio surgery, he has over the years has developed a lot of expertise, and I'm so excited that uh, he was the first uh, radiation oncologist to work with the equipment here at Vero. And the next uh, speaker to follow will be uh, David Barranco. Um, he looks like a neurosurgeon. It might come from central casting in Hollywood. He's the perfect neurosurgeon, uh, but a very experienced neurosurgeon at BNI for over the course of his career, 30 years. Experienced in just about every aspect of, of uh, skull base and different tumor radiation and surgery. And he'll be speaking about his specific experience this year with the ZAP-X. So to lead things off, uh, Igor Barani. So please welcome Igor Barani. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you, John, for that introduction. It's great to see many of familiar faces here at Snell. Um, so I, um, I thought that I uh, introduced the uh, ZAPEX uh, radio surgical system and uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, internal uh, workings of the system, give you an overview of its anatomy, and then I would turn over um, uh, the presentation to Dr. Barenko, who will talk to you about uh, uh, some case studies and case presentations to give you a sense uh, of the versatility of the device in performing a lot of the radio surgical treatments. So without further ado, uh, um, let's, let's start. Uh, can you advance the slide? Oh, here we go. OK. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Barrow. So Barrow Neurological Institute um, 
is uh, located down here in Phoenix, just uh, and about 30 minutes away. It has about 30 neurosurgeons, three radiation oncologists, and we do have one of the largest volumes uh, of brain tumor surgeries in the U.S., about 5,500 tumors treated per year. Um, and we were the first to have the Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife, and now the Zapex radiosurgical system. Um, it's a quaternary neurosurgical referral center and home of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, and you can probably see uh, there is a, a fairly large booth uh, to talk about uh, our IV brain tumor efforts, uh, which is a $50 million uh, initiative to change um, the paradigms of brain tumor treatments. And we also have many phase uh, zero, two, and three clinical trials. Um, so I'm going to come here from a point of view of uh, having had experience with all of these uh, devices and uh, talk a little bit about Zapex and some of the unique features of the device and how it's helping us to, um, uh, in John's words, democratize radio surgery. So um, uh, basically, uh, Zapex radio surgical platform is really trying to address an unmet need. And the need is that there is an estimated 2 million brain tumor patients worldwide, worldwide that are potential candidates for radio surgery, but not quite 200,000 of them can actually receive radio surgical treatments. One of the reasons for this is that radio surgery tends to be concentrated in specialty centers. The equipment and the operations tend to be expensive and complex. And ZAP is trying to address that and really bring a radio surgery to the point of care, closer to the point of care, whether it's a medical oncology office, a radiation oncology satellite clinic, or somewhere where patients uh, can have uh, more easy uh, access to the treatment. Um, and as you know, uh, many of you, um, radio surgery has now becoming, is becoming more of a de facto standard for treatment of brain metastases uh, as people are slowly abandoning uh, whole brain treatments, even though whole brain still has uh, um, a utility in subset of patients. So what is Zatbank's uh, radio surgical platform? It is a self-shielded uh, system designed for cranial radio surgery. Um, it really, um, uh, the novel, uh, largest, biggest novelty uh, of this device is that it really obviates the need for a bunker or radiation treatment bolts. So, you know, as you know, uh, when you're involved in capital uh, uh, equipment decisions, um, in radiation oncology, vault space, shielded bunkers are a significant source of expense, and ZAP does away with this. It also introduces a lot of automation, which uh, reduces uh, uh, operational overhead. So because of this lack of radiation treatment vaults, it is possible to expand ZAP, uh, uh, ZAP, uh, ZAPX uh, treatments and radio surgery to satellites and satellite clinics uh, without a lot of significant upfront costs, and this really makes it appealing uh, for a variety of uh, scenarios, and bottom line is it brings radio surgery closer to the point of care. This is a linac based device, so really there's no need for costly source replacements. And for those of you who have gamma knife experience, uh, you know that every five years or so you have to replace uh, the gamma knife source, and also at the end of those uh, five years, the treatments take roughly twice as long with gamma knife as they do when the source is replaced. And that also creates additional uh, operational overhead, which uh, uh, makes treatments more expensive and uh, from the economic standpoint, less desirable. So uh, because of the uh, self-shielded nature of this device and essentially this being a unit that integrates software planning and treatment uh, as one, uh, there is minimal regulatory and uh, uh, security, uh, there are minimal regulatory and security needs. And uh, having worked with uh, the state of Arizona, um, uh, and radiation safety office in our hospital. This was a very uh, straightforward rollout. We were um, obviously having this first unit. We were extra cautious about making sure that it, it met the specification uh, uh, that were provided around shielding and uh, it exceeded those and we are very comfortable treating on it. So just to give you some additional information, uh, this device consists of a 3 MB S-band Linac, which is ideally suited for intracranial treatments. It has a fairly high, high dose rate of 1,500 mUs a minute, 45 centimeters source to access distance, and uh, we can treat easily with over 260 um, non-complainer beams. This is a cross-sectional view of the device, and what I'm going to show you are features that are relevant for treatment, positioning, and imaging. So uh, the first, um, uh, uh, first uh, uh, parts of the device highlighted here are the LINAC right here, and then you have the uh, mega voltage imaging, de imaging detector and a dose monitoring um, uh, uh, device. 
And this is something that you can actually see on the treatment console, but the real-time dose delivery. And it's, uh, it's a very novel and fascinating feature of, uh, of, this treatment, uh, of this treatment platform. There's also a unique collimator here that allows for um, collimators of eight different aperture sizes. Uh, it is a collimator carousel, and I'll show you uh, close-up views of that um, shortly. Um, additionally, we have the KV imaging um, and uh, the um, three degrees of freedom robotic couch. In terms of shielding, we have this um, uh, shielded treatment sphere. Uh, I'll provide dimensions shortly, but it's a fairly spacious interior and allows uh, 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 um, for uh, comfortable patient treatments and uh, uh, quite, a, quite a bit of, uh, quite a few solid angles uh, to access uh, tumors, uh, not just intracranially, but into the mid cervical spine. And then we also have a rotary shielded shell as well as, well as uh, uh, a vertical shielded door. So looking at the exoskeleton in a little bit more detail, there are two axes of rotations. So uh, this uh, 3D gyroscopic gantry um, uh, provides extensive solid angle coverage, as I mentioned. And then uh, the internal um, uh, the bore diameter is similar to a large bore CT or CT SIM. And it's larger than the standard 60 centimeter MRI. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite spacious. The interior itself is about 165 centimeters in diameter. Uh, it's ventilated. There's, uh, there are access ports for uh, tubing. So we had several patients who needed supplemental oxygen and so on. And we were able to actually uh, access uh, um, uh, the uh, built-in um, built uh, uh, supplemental oxygen and other lines. So it's a, a well-designed, well-thought-out system. Um, we were initially concerned that claustrophobic patients may have challenge tolerating this given its enclosed nature, but this turned out not to be the case. Um, and uh, as you well know, with CyberKnife and Linac based treatments, most of the claustrophobia comes from the mask itself as an immobilization device, uh, not the uh, enclosure itself. And we found that claustrophobic patients tolerate this treatment uh, very well and um, uh, do not require more than uh, outpatient oral sedation uh, um, mildly. Um, so here's the, uh, the uh, overview of the beam colonna uh, collimation. It's a tungsten shielding, a shielded collimating head and carousel, and uh, this provides uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, beam shielding and uh, gives us options of eight different conical collimator sizes. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, with uh, the number of permutations of these collimators, you can es essentially treat tumors of any size and shape efficiently. Um, there's very low radiation leakage due to the, the design of this collimator head, um, where less than 0.01% uh, uh, of the primary beam um, uh, is uh, um, uh, primary beam leakage is detectable. So this is uh, uh, you know uh, com compares very very favorably to um, a multipurpose MLC leakage that you see with uh, radiosurgical uh, treatment uh, devices or modifications to conventional Linux. Here is an internal view of this collimator um, of this collimator assembly. Here is the collimator carousel, and here's the shielded device. One thing that I like about this picture is that uh, the um, Zapac system has uh, these um, uh, apertures or portholes, essentially windows, so the patients can see outside, and we can see uh, from outside in uh, during treatment, um, and uh, this has been uh, uh, very much welcomed by patients. And um, I will show you how our, uh, uh, our uh, room, treatment room is arranged. Uh, there's a patient viewing gallery, uh, and that adds to patient comfort. So in terms of uh, beam collimation, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I wanted to show you that uh, the uh, beam cross profiles um, are very, um, very, very good and uh, what you would expect for, an, uh, for a radiosurgical device. Um, this came from a, a, a recent publication. And in terms of treatment planning, uh, uh, the primary imaging uh, uh, and dose calculation data set consists of a CT scan, and then secondary fusion images can be uh, of any type in DICOM format, whether it's CT, MR, or PET CT. Um, the uh, isocentric planning and delivery is the main uh, way of treatment planning currently. Um, and essentially, for those of you who are familiar with the Gamma Knife system, uh, it's very similar to shot packing that you do. Um, and uh, you get very quick and rapid feedback because the dose calculation uh, gives you a near instant overview of the isodose lines as you're um, you uh, doing the planning. 
Uh, one thing I did want to mention, it's a feature that we're very, very excited about, and uh, we've seen the prototype uh, of the inverse planning. Uh, this is currently pending FDA clearance, and this uh, further increases not just efficiency, but also improves consistency of treatment planning, and that's something that uh, uh, goes a long way in terms of uh, uh, reducing the tr uh, total treatment planning time and making this device more automated. Um, the ray tracing algorithm is currently being used to do these calculations, uh, and uh, some of this is GPU accelerated, and you can get very rapid and iterative feedback as you're doing the planning. And uh, I can tell you that uh, thanks to Zap, many aspects of the treatment planning have been improved and automated uh, since day zero deployment based on our feedback. And uh, the device now uh, operates uh, very, very smoothly, and it's quite reliable. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of the treatment planning uh, system. Uh, this treatment planning system is really arranged around the central feature, which we call the tool wheel. And I'll walk you through some aspects of this. And it's really designed to kind of walk you step by step through a treatment planning process. So it's quite intuitive. You start out with fusion, and then you have contouring features, and then subsequently you have a variety of planning, uh, uh, planning features here, including uh, shots, uh, isocenter placement, dose calculation, dose optimization, prescription, and then uh, one of the features that uh, I'll be very much welcome and, um, uh, at Barrow, since we have so many neurosurgeons who participate in this process, is that plan review and approval is really designed uh, to promote collaborative uh, treatment planning, and this is something that's, uh, uh, that's, um, uh, that make the, our day-to-day um, -day workflow uh, much, much easier. Now, I'm not a big fan of uh, dose comparisons for those of you who, who know me, but uh, um, I, we've been asked uh, for some of these. So I <coughs> provide here rough dose comparisons for the same lesion being treated on CyberKnife versus Zap, uh, ZapX. And I just want to really show you that in, uh, in aggregate, you get very, uh, uh, very good dose distribution and conformality as you would expect from any radiosurgical system. Uh, here's another case um, of uh, a tentorial meningioma. Uh, that can uh, that compares the two, and you can see that uh, it's very much in line what you would expect uh, from radiosurgical treatment. Uh, so overall, uh, we've been uh, um, uh, very pleased with the device uh, and the treatment delivery. The reliability has been excellent. Um, uh, it's uh, unlike any other device that I worked with. Uh, uh, we had really uh, minimal, if any, uh, patient-related downtime, and uh, this has been great. So. Um, this is a view of the pendant, which is at the place at the foot of the machine. So this uh, uh, allows for therapists to put the patient into the device itself. And you can see the treatment console, treatment, treatment console is right here. And here is that uh, a viewing gallery for patient's family. Uh, so they can be intimately um, uh, involved with the patient and during their treatment. And uh, it really helps improve patient comfort. Here's another view. Uh, uh, this is uh, the actual treatment. I, I believe this was our first patient that we treated. So you can see uh, uh, we have a lot of faith uh, in the shielding of this device. We're standing right here. The patient is getting treated, uh, and uh, it's all in the same room in open space. One thing that I wanted to show you here, uh, this is the real-time dose symmetry that Zap is capable of doing. So as you deliver each shot, you can actually see the dose build up uh, uh, here in real time. Uh, this is a, a feature that uh, currently we're using uh, primarily just for um, dose delivery ver verification, but I think there are plans uh, to use feedback from uh, uh, the transmitted dose to help improve dose delivery. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, what the whole process looks like end to end. So uh, this is the inside of the device. So the patient is immobilized uh, in a, a thermoplastic mask. Um, uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, the shield at the foot of the patient closes second and the, uh, the circular uh, uh, shielding closes first and then um, uh, the patient delivery is uh, essentially automated. There is uh, image guidance uh, um, that's uh, fairly automated and just requires initial setup approval and then the treatment delivery uh, takes place as you would expect on any other uh, uh, radiosurgical LINAC. Um, the treatment console, as I mentioned, is just right outside, uh, so it's uh, truly uh, um, you know, a different experience for both therapists, physicians, and patients because we're all essentially in the same room, and uh, this very much adds to the, the uh, comfort factor that patients experience. Um, 
So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Branko now to talk about some of our uh, clinical cases, and you'll see a medley of cases uh, to kind of illustrate the versatility uh, of radiosurgical treatment with this device, and uh, um, after that, we'll probably take questions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I thought it would be helpful just to illustrate some of the uh, uh, different types of cases we've uh, treated patients uh, over the past uh, nine to ten months. Uh, this was obviously a first machine in a state that had never uh, had this type of device before, and so our approach to this was a slow ramp up of trying different things. We had to validate each uh, patient treatment initially uh, in the beginning, both with mock uh, trials and phantoms and, and whatnot. Our, our method of selecting patients is, is essentially based upon a, a multi-modality uh, 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 tumor conference that's weekly. Uh, those, the weekly conference consists of every patient who has undergone surgery that week or uh, a patient whose neuro-oncologist or, or uh, neuroradiation oncologist uh, determines that they need to be reevaluated. Typically, we present anywhere from um, 30 to 40 cases a week, the majority of which are uh, fresh post-op patients. Uh, the panel consists of uh, neuropathology, uh, neuroradiation oncologists such as Dr. Rogers, Dr. Barani, the neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, and neuroradiologists. And each case is discussed. Uh, we are fortunate at this point to have uh, three main platforms for the use of radiosurgery, uh, those platforms being uh, Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife, and the uh, Zapex uh, machine. And plus, we have the regular conventional radiation oncology tools. So based upon the, the uh, discussion, we first determine is it a radiosurgery case or not a radiosurgery case. If it is a radiosurgery case, are there certain parameters such as severe claustrophobia, um, number of uh, metastases, side, size or shape of the uh, lesion that would make it preferential for one modality rather than another? And it would be a little difficult to explain that right now, but as time has gone on, our, our um, uh, use of the ZAPX for uh, more complex lesions has increased. In the beginning, we did not want to have some flame-out failure, so we took simpler things, uh, a round, oval, uh, um, uh, simple metastases, uh, recurrent meningiomas, uh, things of that nature, and uh, uh, treated the patients with that. And then as time came, uh, went along, we had increasing uh, software uh, and hardware support. Uh, from uh, um, uh, several of the people at ZAP, and in that capacity, the times, the, uh, the uh, software uh, updates allowed us to start treating uh, uh, more and more things. Uh, we'll get through here. So we currently have six neurosurgeons uh, who, who have been trained. I think there are two still finishing their, their proctoring, <clears throat> and uh, four who are, are, are trained. We have uh, uh, three uh, neuroradiation oncologists who are uh, uh, trained in this, and between the, the uh, nine of us, uh, uh, we get it done. As, as Dr. Barani mentioned, <clears throat> we have a very large volume of brain tumor patients. We treat 5,500 patients a year, many of them uh, in new cases. They're sent in from uh, not only around uh, the state, but from, from elsewhere. And this, is, this program here runs in coordination and parallel with the IV Center, uh, which is uh, trying phase, o, phase zero and phase one trials. Next. Try it. Try it? OK. Got it. So let's try, see if we can look at some of these clinical cases. Our, our first case was obviously uh, one that we had to choose carefully. This is a 60-some-odd-year-old uh, gentleman <clears throat> who had been diagnosed after some personality uh, changes with a large uh, meningioma. He had undergone uh, surgery uh, uh, years before and was diagnosed with an atypical uh, meningioma. He underwent resection of the, uh, of the meningioma, um, it, it, and it turned out to be atypical. Uh, within about a year, year and a half, uh, uh, another lesion grew. Over the course of time, he uh, required uh, s uh, seven craniotomies, two of which were cranioplasties uh, uh, due to uh, uh, um, uh, infection. 
Uh, one of those treatments uh, also included uh, brachytherapy seeds. Want me to try or are you? Okay. So here's this, this gentleman. You can see that there's an enhancing lesion in the left frontal area. Uh, this was the uh, uh, recurrent um, uh, atypical meningioma. Next. Uh, here we are outlining the, the tumor in a usual fashion, just as you would with gamma knife, cyber knife, or the other modalities. Uh, you, uh, next. Uh, here you can see the actual isodose line uh, for a 50% uh, uh, treatment uh, of this lesion. Uh, next number, or a slide. Here's our uh, dose volume uh, histogram. Uh, this uh, patient was uh, uh, treated at uh, uh, 3,000. Um, uh, uh, the 50% isodose line, and we treated him in five fractions. Uh, we treated him five fractions predominantly because of the multiple craniotomies, thin scalp, and he doesn't have a skull there either under the thin scalp, he just has a, a peak uh, cranioplasty. So here's uh, uh, our patient. Um, next slide. As you saw from the previous slides, patient is placed in the automated couch with the mask in place. Next. Uh, the uh, radiation tech uh, has this uh, board that allows them to uh, uh, position the patient and then uh, activate the uh, shielding mechanism. Next. Once the uh, uh, shielding uh, is in place, here you see the sidewall shield going around, as Dr. Barani said, that actually goes up first and then next. Uh, then the uh, uh, end of the uh, uh, vault is sealed, as you see with the black uh, uh, area there at the base of the uh, Zapex machine. At all times, we can see the patient uh, internally. There are multiple cameras. We can see the uh, radiation delivery uh, LINAC-based uh, device. <clears throat> but there's also the use of uh, continuous intermittent uh, X-ray imaging that we merge onto their uh, pre-procedure CT scan. CT scan is, is performed with the mask uh, uh, initially. Um, and what you're looking at on the screen on the, on the left over here is uh, the board that we're using to confirm accuracy. The checkerboard one is an overlay of the patient's uh, instantaneously obtained, in, instantly obtained x-ray within the machine with the CAT scan. We can move the uh, overlay uh, checkerboard pattern and we line up the inner and outer tables and make sure that everything looks uh, correct. We have a lateral and an AP uh, view. Next slide. <clears throat> um, this uh, next patient that we uh, uh, treated was a 75-year-old <clears throat> who presented with some uh, right upper extremity uh, 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 seizure type activity. Uh, the patient also, according to the family, it has a brief period of some confusion and an MRI scan was obtained. Next slide, please. That demonstrated a lesion in the uh, posterior uh, corpus callosum. Uh, this patient underwent uh, surgery with resection of the posterior co uh, corpus callosum lesion. This is uh, not an accurate representation of what it looked like post-op. This is uh, a lot of post-op uh, gliosis. There's some slides I'll show later. You can see the contour of the lesion. You can see the uh, uh, isodose uh, line for the 58% uh, in this case. Next slide. This is the, these are the axial uh, slices of the, of the uh, gliotic uh, cavity where it was. Uh, next slide. So this uh, uh, tumor, uh, once outlined, uh, isocenters placed, uh, uh, was treated and, and had an uh, excellent result. Uh, th this was a pulmonary carcinoid metastasis uh, in, in this patient. Next slide. So as you can see, we're trying different types of tumors along the way. We didn't want to just keep treating meningiomas or whatever. Uh, this is a 68-year-old who presented with several weeks of confusion. Um, the patient was brought in to an outside hospital with some expressive aphasia where the ER doctor uh, felt that he might have had a, a stroke. He had a history of tobacco use and, and valley fever and an MRI scan demonstrated a uh, left temporal lesion and a small lesion, next slide, in the left uh, uh, occipital uh, areas. One of the things, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is when we are placing the shots, it's much like gamma knife. It's a forward shot packing technique. Uh, that obviously takes a little time. 
uh, placing the shots, moving them in the X, Y, and Z uh, coordinates, up weighting them and down weighting them in order to uh, get a, a good conformal uh, uh, treatment uh, plan. Uh, we're excited about the fact that uh, next month the inverse planning uh, software uh, will be uh, uh, activated and then we'll be able to shorten our planning uh, uh, component of the patient treatment uh, by quite a bit. Here, here's a uh, 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 cavity where uh, the larger lesion uh, was resected. Next slide. You can see the <clears throat> uh, small craniotomy opening. The cavity is here outlined. Next slide. Uh, each of these uh, uh, cross hatches represents a shot placement with the forward shot uh, planning methodology. And here's our uh, uh, dose volume uh, histogram, something that you're very uh, familiar with. Next slide. This patient also uh, uh, had a, a, a small metastasis here. Next slide. And uh, these small metastases, which are, are really uh, going to be one of the uh, fastest and easiest things to, uh, to treat and will uh, make treating a meta uh, metastatic disease uh, uh, far simpler for so many of these patients uh, was employed in, in this patient. Next slide. Here's a 55-year-old patient with a history of breast cancer, one-day history of dysarthria and fa facial droop. So this is, is a uh, breast uh, uh, metastasis. Next slide. Uh, you can uh, see here where a craniotomy has been per performed. There's uh, some air in the cavity. Next slide. Once again, contouring. Next slide. Uh, and, then we, and then we treated. 63-year-old involved in a motor vehicle accident after a seizure. Uh, was uh, neurologically intact in the emergency room. MRI scan demonstrated a massive right frontal uh, meningioma. This was uh, resected by one of my uh, partners. And then uh, he underwent surveillance scans for uh, multiple years. Uh, but uh, uh, this past year, there started to be the uh, in, uh, development of a thickened, uh, homogeneously enhancing abnormality in the right frontal uh, uh, region here on the dura. Uh, you can see it compared to the uh, left side. Uh, based upon prior scans, we could confirm that this was uh, some early recurrence. Next slide. Here, uh, you know, we have an uh, oval, uh, uh, elongated abnormality, a, a little more difficult in terms of the number of shots because in, uh, uh, in the beginning phases here, the number of shots correlated highly with lengthy procedures. So we would always calculate how many were going to be required. We had the benefit here of an encephalomalasic region where the large meningioma previously had been resected, which allowed us to do some overage into a cavity that didn't have any brain tissue that would be safe for the patient. And uh, this patient was, uh, next slide, uh, treated uh, uh, in, a, in the usual fashion. Next slide. That was a regular meningioma as, a, as opposed to our first patient who was uh, complicated atypical. This is a 71-year-old uh, gentleman who had uh, known renal cell cancer, uh, had known uh, metastasis, and the patient had undergone serial MRI scans uh, over the years and had undergone uh, four prior gamma knife procedures, all of which worked uh, well for uh, uh, stereotactic uh, control of his uh, CNS disease. He underwent his standard uh, uh, MRI uh, uh, follow-up and was found to have a small uh, uh, lesion. Uh, you can see uh, uh, where he had had his surgery pre uh, previously. Um, next slide. That patient was treated and a treatment of a small lesion like that uh, t uh, took nine minutes once the patient was uh, in the machine. Now it's, uh, it's faster. So <clears throat> the, the, uh, we're at a point now where we're getting our first uh, and in some cases a second uh, follow-up uh, uh, scan. So the, obviously it's all good and well that we can treat these, we can outline them, we can uh, zap them so to, say, so to be, but the question is did, did it work because it doesn't help any of us if it doesn't work. This is that same first patient. <clears throat> you can see the uh, before and after uh, MRI scans, uh, the uh, tumor in the left frontal lobe uh, did not change over a course of six months. And you may say, well, how do you know it was going to change? Well, we, we knew it had been enlarging. Next slide. But if you look here, this is the patient's <coughs> right side. It's the exact same patient. And over the course of six months, 
a new nodular atypical uh, meningioma was recurring on the patient's contralateral side. Next slide. And we know it wasn't there because here's the MRI scan from the day of treatment. So on the left side, we have control of a, of a lesion in the short interval of the first six-month follow-up scan, but in that interim, there was the development of a new right-sided nodular lesion that required treatment. Next slide. Here's that patient that I mentioned earlier. This is the uh, resection in the uh, posterior corpus callosum of the pulmonary carcinoid metastasis. This is the immediate uh, post-op scan. We normally get a scan within 24 hours, so there isn't enhancement and, and gliotic changes that's, that can be confusing. This is the one on the day of treatment that I showed you had a lot of gliotic uh, uh, change. Here's that uh, patient six months uh, later. Uh, certainly this has responded, and we know, we know uh, yes, next slide, and we know other things have popped up. This is the same patient. She has a, n a new uh, uh, carcinoid metastasis in the CP angle on the left side, and uh, she ended up uh, being treated for this uh, at, that, at that time. Next slide. Glioblastomas, uh, the bane of our uh, existence. Uh, this is a patient who had had a right uh, temporal uh, glioblastoma resected approximately a year previously, had undergone standard uh, adjuvant radiation therapy uh, with uh, Temidar and uh, uh, radiation therapy. On a surveillance scan, uh, I think it was approximately 11 months later, had a recurrence in the, in the same region. This is the uh, patient's <clears throat> post-op scan after resection of the recurrence. So this is our uh, uh, day of treatment scan, we decided to give a boost to this region using the Zapex uh, machine in a glioblastoma patient. This is the uh, uh, patient's uh, scan uh, six months later. So this is not to say that the patient isn't going to uh, undergo the usual um, uh, issues with a glioblastoma, but, but uh, we felt good that uh, at least we have bought some more time. Next slide. <clears throat> the patient that we showed you earlier uh, who had undergone four gamma knife treatments and the gamma knife treatments uh, worked well. This is the one we treated for the um, left medial frontal uh, small metastasis, the eight to nine minute treatment. Here you can see, a, see the uh, follow-up <coughs> uh, scan without the overlay of all of the gamma knife uh, treatments. That's something we do for our tumor conference to differentiate new lesions from previously treated lesions and you can see uh, six months later, there's been no, uh, uh, no change in the, uh, uh, in the treated uh, lesion. Uh, this is a patient who had metastatic squamous cells. So we just keep picking different pathologies, different locations, uh, and uh, just to give a, a, a more broad and diverse perspective as to what we can treat or what we may have issues with. And, and this is a patient who had a recurrence of a, of a tumor back here. This is the, uh, bef uh, the day of treatment uh, uh, scan. This is a patient who did not have any enhancing abnormality in the right uh, uh, posterior occipital region. This is their uh, uh, scan um, just three months later because uh, this patient was treated more recently. So the, the uh, point of this is not that, uh, that uh, we can contour these things and uh, treat the patients, but uh, our initial experience, which is obviously very brief, it's only approximately nine to 10 months, and we needed a minimum of uh, six months for most of these patients to get some validation of the treatment, has shown that they are responding extremely well, as we'd expect from uh, a proven uh, technology such as uh, uh, linac based uh, radio surgery. Uh, uh, so far, uh, we have only had uh, uh, one day of downtime in terms of the uh, stability of the platform. Um, we had one day where a cable got loose and, and the cable had to be uh, uh, tightened. Uh, having lived through the uh, uh, initiation of the CyberKnife uh, at our hospital, which I'm sorry, John, that was your device, but uh, we, we, we were down probably uh, two or three times every uh, two weeks, sometimes for four or five days uh, at a shot. 
So uh, that was one of the uh, biggest uh, concerns our group had, having lived through that. Obviously, once the, the issues uh, were resolved, then it, it's been a phenomenal machine since then. <clears throat> but we have not had any of those headaches that we were really quite uh, uh, worried about. Uh, right now, obviously, we're in the, in the uh, phase of establishing the data for something um, more conclusive in some um, uh, literature uh, that will be published. We've treated over 40 patients with over 63 uh, lesions in the past uh, uh, nine and a half to 10 months. And uh, in the coming year, we will uh, uh, publish something that gives some, some greater validation to the, uh, the applicability of this treatment. But it has been uh, 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 a good learning experience. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of bumps initially on the road, but for the past uh, uh, two or three months with uh, the initial things uh, worked out, things just keep getting faster and faster. Uh, the patients have not had uh, major uh, uh, issues. The claustrophobia issue, which one would have some concerns about when uh, you see the device. On film, you, you can't have a sense that inside it's much larger. It's not like a bore of an MRI scan, it's more like a diving bell. Uh, if uh, I have patients who say that they have claustrophobia but they can take a Valium in an MRI and that's all they need for their surveillance MRIs or whatever, uh, we have no issues. If you have somebody who needs an IV sedation protocol to get a, a mere MRI, uh, we have not uh, gone that route yet, although we have our ZAP unit, as any of the, you who uh, come down to see it, all, all set up for uh, uh, anesthesia machines. There are portals for uh, IV access, uh, uh, supplemental oxygen, and everything like that for when we get to that next, uh, next phase of, uh, of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Igor. Perhaps just come up for a minute or two and just uh, if there's any questions from the audience. Um, obviously, ZAP has been exhilarating to be able to work with BNI. It is really one of the preeminent centers for neurosurgery and brain tumor in the world today. Uh, they, between these two guys and the rest of the team there, they have experience with every significant radiosurgical platform. Um, and uh, yes, this is they're our shakedown team. and. We're in the earliest few months, there's always a few hiccups along the way, but I think we're, we've moved past that, and the team collectively between B&I and ZAP, we grow more efficient uh, literally every month, and the software every bit more capable. And um, going forward, we plan to conquer the world together, and perhaps some of you would like to join that team as well going forward. So um, does anyone have any questions for myself or either Igor or David? Steve, uh, North Carolina. Two completely unrelated questions. One is in the event of an emergency treatment stop for patient reasons. How long does it take to get the patient back out of the device or commissioning and such? And secondly, when you're revisiting a patient who needs a second, third, or fourth treatment, is the software capable of doing appliance summation? Yeah. So maybe I can take the first part. So uh, the device has an emergency procedure built in, and uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a big red button to, that allows us to stop the treatment, and essentially all the shielding quickly opens up its pneumatic, so it's uh, fairly instant. And uh, there is a way to manually move the table out. So it's actually, compared to gamma knife uh, uh, procedure, this is uh, a little bit quicker. Um, and I think uh, you know, the table is also fairly light uh, to move the patient out, whereas with gamma knife, as you know, it's uh, it's quite heavy and, and yeah, so it's it, there's a very simple, straightforward process for that. Do you want to take the other? Oh, and uh, sorry. This ends that summation. Oh, and the second question was about uh, dose. Uh, so essentially, for follow-up scans and doing dose uh, integration. Uh, yes, we have that capability. Um, we initially um, did things out of workflow, but now that capability is going to be included in uh, in the next release of the planning software. I mean, that's why it's been so useful to have an experienced team using it because their feedback is pretty quickly integrated into the product as we go forward. I mean, we're a brand new product, but uh, this team will tell you we've been evolving quickly. And fortunately, myself and uh, Mohan Bhattarai, who may stand up there in the background, uh, we created, you know, the CyberKnife once upon a time. So you're going to find very few teams who are well prepared to make a next generation platform as we were. Yes? 
Uh, I like how this is being marketed as uh, something that can be placed in areas with good resources. Uh, in a place like Faro, where you have many options, in which scenarios would you choose uh, ZAPEX over standard care? So currently, uh, that is under, under evolution, because in the beginning, we had to make sure it worked, that there weren't glitches, that there weren't patient issues, uh, shutdowns. So in the beginning, the, the first 15 patients we treated, we, we chose the initial ones I, I showed you, and then subsequently some, extra, you know, uh, some of the other slides were extras. We would choose rounder, more oval, things that would require fewer than maybe uh, the nine, easiest case nine, or, nine or ten shots if you were doing a gamma knife plan. Uh, once some of the timing aspects became faster for the treatment, and some of that had to do with we do uh, uh, x-ray imaging every 45 seconds uh, during treatment so that we can make sure that the overlay still matches and, and the conformality will remain excellent. Uh, but they've sped up the software for doing that and our treatment times have decreased. Right now, we are using it for metastases. We are using it for small to, to mid-size uh, uh, meningiomas or, or uh, uh, I think we're, uh, we've treated one acoustic uh, in a hypofractionated uh, fashion. Anyone who we have to treat hypofractionated has, it will be either ZAP or CyberKnife. Um, anybody who has an aversion to the head pins or something will we'll go to those. If we have somebody with 15 metastasis or something like that, we're not going to be treating them right now with ZAP, but we will in the future because that timing when they get to the active arc phase will be even, even faster than it is, is now. So it, it's been a uh, baptism under fire trying to figure out who's best and, and just advancing that. But we're treating a lot now. I, I, I can maybe add to that a little bit. <coughs> so, sorry. Um, the you know, one other thing, consideration that we have is um, that you know there's the logistical scheduling uh, patients, so availability of the device. But you know one of the the things with gamma knife, as I mentioned earlier, when the source you know decays over time, the treatment time gets longer. For us to staff that with a therapist uh, or you know physicist and a nurse, essentially becomes twice as long, five years, right? So. Uh, from a radiation oncology standpoint, that's a consideration because those people are unavailable to do other things in the department. So the preference for us is to do Linux-based radio surgery whenever possible. I mean, gamma knife definitely has a place and a role. Still, uh, you know, we we do some functional stuff uh, uh, and, and high dose stuff uh, on gamma knife, uh, but uh, you know, there is a operational consideration that I think we often overlook when we look at just clinical cases. But uh, but those are some real you know economical concerns. But. Um I'll take the liberty of proposing that, and you guys can agree or not, is that you plan in the next year to basically be treating the vast majority of your patients uh, on the ZAPEX, that's correct? Yes, I mean, we'll, this trans there's a transition period, but where you're, where you're headed as, a, as an institution is... The, the, the people with the next generation uh, of devices being deployed will, will have the advantages of, of the trial and error phase being over. And the learning curve. Yeah, the learning, learning curve. will be past the learning the, curve. The gray hair phase will be, hopefully be over. As my Japanese colleagues like to say, the, what is it? the learning curve, the learning mm -hmm. curve. Right, Dr. Mariano? Yes, sir. Hi there. Um, how is the image guidance acquired again? It's essentially a set of cross-firing kilovoltage x-rays, uh, so that's really what's used for immobilization right now. We found that uh, that approach is actually much faster and provides the same level of uh, setup accuracy, and as you know, there are other x-ray-based systems for setup as well. So comb beam, you have to wait for the motion. Uh, in this case, th this is much, much, much quicker. Cross-firing x-rays are built into the machine. They are, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for all coming and sharing your lunch with us. Uh, one last reminder, I'm hoping as many as you as possible might join us the evening, this evening at BNI and actually see it with your own eyes. I continue to believe this is the coolest medical device ever created in human history. The coolest medical device. Come, come see it with your own eyes. Make sure you show up promptly uh, before 5 o'clock, before 5 o'clock. Thank you.